Awesome. Thanks, Susan. Yes, indeed. I am a fussy coffee drinker. I have discovered that as you get more into coffee, it, it crosses those that line towards being very scientific and very mechanical. And that really suits me. If you know me as a computer science educator, then that certainly fits my style. So uh, so playing with coffee is, is one of those things that I do. And I end up with nice coffee. So that's, you know, that's a bonus as well. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, so hopefully everybody can see that and then I'm going to do what I do with my students and I'm going to stick the chat down here in the corner just in case anybody's got any questions as we go along. Um, so, uh, so today's presentation is actually a preview presentation. This is a paper uh, that we are hoping to present at the Ascolite conference at the end of the year. And uh, we already had Wendy plugging the Ascolite Teleadvisors Special Interest Group. Um, but I'm, I'm actually on the Ascolite Executive, and so I'm going to plug Ascolite as well. Ascolite is a great community if you're interested in deep knowledge enhanced learning. And so it, the conference is virtual this year, as are most conferences. Uh, but if you're interested in, in, in how we use technology in learning and teaching, then Ascolite's a great uh, uh, organization to join and as Wendy noted you can join the SIGs for free the Teleadvisor SIG is Wendy's SIG I'm involved in the open educational practice SIG and also the uh, um, digital equity SIG as well uh, but as well as that if you're a CQU staff member I heard just between you me and the wall that we have an institutional membership and I think we have a couple of spots still available for institutional membership of Ascolite itself and so that would allow you to come along to all of the meetings and various other things. So there's my plug for Ascolite for you, right? Just while we're talking about it anyway. But this presentation is a, is a, a preview of what we were planning to do at Ascolite. It is a conceptual paper that I came up with earlier this year in conjunction with uh, Dr. Rob Vandenberg, who is part of the new College of Education as part of the School of Education and the Arts here at CQU, and I am uh, part of the College of Information Technology, Information and Communication Technology in the School of Engineering and Technology here at CQU. And Robert and I came up with this paper predominantly because um, I work in, area, in the area of mixed reality. I work in mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, all the stuff that involves those headsets and I can reach over my shoulder and I could show you one. There's one sitting on the couch behind me. Um, basically this idea that we want to immerse people in some sort of virtual world, virtual experience. And Robert, he works in the area of, of, of primary and secondary education. And in particular, he's educating his own son. He homeschools his son, who is, is at the later stages of primary and secondary school. And he said to me, some of these things that I'm teaching my son, I mean, we could, why can't we make these more interactive? Why can't we integrate these into some sort of virtual reality simulation rather than teaching my son formulas and teaching my son mathematical stuff? Why don't we actually give him an experience of those, those concepts that is virtual. And I said, well, that sounds kind of like a research project, Roger, Robert. We could, we could spend some time on that. And I said to him, well, what is the educational theory? And he suggested to me, well, why don't we do a Vygotskyan educational theory to actually pursue this? And I went, what's Vygotsky? And that was, that was, and I, I led out down this, down this rabbit hole of understanding what Vygotsky and educational theory was. And so that's where this came from. And so far it's just a concept, but we're hoping to get some funding and, uh, and push forward and actually build a virtual reality physics instructional environment, as it says on the slide, based on this idea of, of Vygotsky and educational theory. So, I've done what I usually do with my students, which is that I've kind of gotten a little bit ahead of myself in terms of my introduction, uh, but that's okay. We can catch up as we go along. Um, it isn't actually that uncommon for us to teach, in particular, physics education using virtual reality. So, you know, as, as, a, as an academic doing what Darren was just talking about, the first thing you do is you go and you do a lit review, right? And you work out what other people have done. And it isn't that uncommon for us to try and teach physics education um, using computing and using technology. It, it's, it's one of those ideas, but it isn't that common for us to teach uh, 
physics education in virtual reality. And in particular, Robert and I identified through our lit review that it is very uncommon um, for us to teach uh, Vygotskyan style physics using virtual reality. And Vygotskyan style physics using virtual reality is this idea that we actually want an instructional environment for the students. We want the students to work together and socially construct their learning uh, as opposed to uh, throwing them into an environment and then allowing them to just sort of uh, play essentially. Uh, and that is the much more common approach. And you could actually, um, you could actually describe that as Piaget and you could, Piaget is another popular educational theorist and he, he suggested that we instruct the students traditionally and then we expose the students to this overall sandbox environment. Um, so most of what we found when we did our lit review is, is th these approaches that are much more Piaget based, right? This idea that you throw the students, you teach them first using traditional methods and then you throw them in the sandbox and they play around with the virtual reality and in doing so, hopefully reinforce all of those physics concepts. And so Robert and I saw a gap there and we went, oh, this is awesome. I mean, let's, let's try this Vygotskyan approach. Let's try and get the students to actually collaborate together in this virtual reality space. And the idea, of course, ultimately is to, um, is to see whether or not this enhances the student's learning. Whenever you do educational technology research, that's the holy grail, right? The holy grail is did this improve the student's learning? I mean, it is easy, and I don't mean to dismiss anyone else's work, but it is, it is often easy to say, did the students enjoy this? Were they more motivated? Were they more engaged by this technology? And Peter Goodyear, who's a, a prominent educational uh, theorist and technologist, he called them happy sheets at one point, right? So you, get, you issue the students the happy sheets and they all come back and say, yes, we're happy because they all enjoy playing with VR and AR. So of course they're happy, it's novel, it's interesting. But what you really wanna know is did they actually learn more effectively? And to do that, you need a, a slightly different research design. So ultimately our research question was how can a VR environment for physics education utilising Vygotskyan concepts be used to enhance the students learning? That's what we're particularly interested in. And as I said to you, this is something that people haven't done in the past. Um, there are our physics simulations out there uh, but as is often the case with technology, technology races ahead really quickly. And so you see a lot of these simulations and a lot of these simulations, they are single user uh, and they are often two dimensional simulations as well. So I've given you a few there from sort of history from the last 20 years or so, just a couple of snapshots of things that did um, physics simulation in a 2D world. Um, which was FET, uh, Kim and, and Wu, and also Zhong and Lin, uh, sorry, Kim, and then Wu, Kang, John and Lin presented as well a, a WebView physics model. Um, there are some immersive simulations and probably the most popular one these days is Maroon VR, which has a basic immersive VR simulation, but it's generally presented as a single user rather than a multi-user simulation. And then in the past, 10 years, there have also been simulations that use custom hardware as well. And that's one of the big changes in VR in the last five years. And that's why Robert and I think that we can do this because we have the ability to use this commercially available hardware. So this piece of technology that I'm holding up right now is the Oculus Quest. And the Oculus Quest is developed by Facebook. Uh, this is actually an old headset. It's worth about $650, uh, but they just released the new version, the Quest 2 which is worth $300. Uh, so we now have this very affordable, or much more affordable than it was in the past, commercially available VR hardware. And so we have the mechanism to actually get these things into those primary and secondary school classrooms and also those beginning university classrooms as well. So I told you that this was uh, a Vygotskyan approach um, and I've kind of already told you a little bit about what the difference is between Vygotsky and Piaget. And, and this is where it would be really good if I had Robert here, but I don't think I do, unless he's hiding. No, I think he's, I think he's, I think he hasn't been able to join us today. Um, 
because he would tell you for a thousand years about Piaget and Vygotsky. That was, this was the focus of his PhD thesis. So he knows a lot more about this than me. But to summarize and probably bastardize, and if you're an educational theorist, I apologize. Uh, Piaget is, is much more focused on this idea of uh, instructing the students and then allowing them to focus on the theory and the environment without, that in, without further instructional support. So we have this two-stage process where you instruct them and then you then you give them an opportunity to reinforce their learning uh, themselves afterwards and you could do that in VR you could also do that traditionally Piaget did that traditionally he didn't have VR uh, whereas Vygotsky says well we what we should actually do is students learn through socialization and through talking to each other and so the whole process should actually be um, through the virtual representation. So rather than saying, let's teach the students on the whiteboard first and then throw them in VR later on, let's teach the students in VR. Let's actually develop a lesson plan and instructional plan that actually works in VR. Let's sit down and walk them through it and scaffold it for them step by step. And then let's let the students communicate with each other to socially construct their actual learning. And Robert was very insistent that importantly, as part of that, we need to uh, allow them to do the mathematical calculation because ultimately we, we do the, want them to be able to do the math that relates to the physics. And so showing them the experimental stuff uh, is less important or is important, but it's not as important as eventually connecting it back to the math. Um, and then if we want to, we can still provide a sandbox afterwards to reinforce the learning. They can come back and play with the VR and adjust the size of various things and tweak the physics if they want to. That's entirely fine. But the important thing is that the beginning instruction actually happens in the, in the VR environment. And so what's it actually going to look like? What are we suggesting we're actually going to build? Well, we decided that our focus should be on um, orbital motion and on circular motion and on gravity. And luckily we're working on a grant project with a, a foundation in the US and that foundation in the US is called CK12. And CK12 builds a whole bunch of digital mathematics tools that they provide free to students across the US and across the world as well. Some of our education students are using the CK12 tools and um and so they have a math curriculum in their in their tool and so we we borrowed heavily from the ck12 interactive math and physics curriculum and we borrowed from their circular motion and their gravity uh section including the mathematical calculations and then we said well what can we actually do with these and we decided that the best way to think about this yep thank you michael two minutes awesome it's a good amount of time. So, um, so we decided the best way to simulate this would be to allow students to simulate gravity and circular motion using planets and using satellites and various other things. And so you can see a very basic mock up there of the opportunity of a student, for example, to be able to adjust the size of a satellite and the size of a planet in a virtual simulation and then see um, how those satellites and how those um, planets will actually affect the gravity and the circular motion that's actually happening in our simulation. What you don't see in the picture is we also give the students a notebook where they can actually do the calculation so that they can then work out uh, those formulas F equals MA and those various other things that are important to them in the physics curriculum. And so we're going to build that, um, this simulation, and then as I said to you, we're going to test it. And the design uh, research design that I've used for a number of years is called design-based research, and I could give you an entire entire 20 minutes on design-based research if I wanted to. So just very briefly, DBR um, is a really popular mechanism for doing that testing that I was talking about before, for developing a problem, uh, identifying the solutions to the problem, testing that problem, and then collecting feedback from students to refine what that problem actually looks like. And that's supported by a framework that I developed a few years ago called the Pedagogy Before Technology Framework, which starts by asking you what the problem is that you're trying to solve, and then identifies whether there's a piece of technology that can help. And so it's pedagogy first and then technology, uh, which Robert and I, I feel like we did. We said, this is a problem, can we solve? Uh, and now what's a good technology? Maybe VR would work. Uh, so that's the DVR framework. And we'll use that using a combination of quant and qual measures to assess engagement and usability, as I said. But also importantly, we'll do some pre and post testing for our learning outcome changes as well, because we ultimately we want to identify whether these students learn better in virtual reality than they do using the traditional more Piagetian uh, methods of actually teaching.
so that kind of gets me towards the end um, uh, of really what I'm, what, it, what as I said to you, is really just a concept paper at the moment, an idea, some designs, a little bit of a research design. Uh, the paper itself hasn't actually been accepted, so keep your fingers and your toes and various other things crossed. But hopefully, if the paper is accepted, it will be presented at the Ascolite conference later on this year. At that point, if you want a copy of the paper, I am more than happy to share the paper with you and I am more than happy to sit down and have a chat to you about DBR uh, and about virtual reality and mixed reality and, and how all of those things work. Uh, so feel free to touch base with me. Uh, there we go, I'm getting the time out from Susan. So that is perfect timing. If anyone has any questions, please let me know. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, my 13-year-old son would jump at the chance of learning mathematical concepts and or physical physics concepts um, in this format, um, particularly as um, he got me to try the, the uh, Spider-Man VR yes. um, experience the other day, which my old stomach can't cope with jumping off buildings anymore. Um, but I could see students absolutely lapping this up um, so uh, thank you Michael and I know Robert and he would be um, very enthusiastic about this as well yeah. um, a couple of questions have come through uh, the chat box did you want to just respond to them yourself or do you want me to um, read them out no no that's fine I'm happy to field them so Natalie asked um if you're using a Vygotskyan approach, you would also build in the capacity for learners to learn together. Yes, I did miss that entirely, Natalie. A really important part of the simulation we're going to build is it's going to be multi-user. So it's going to give the students the opportunity to talk to each other in the simulation and see what, what, what other students are actually doing with the planets and the various satellites and things. And that's a more difficult mixed reality implementation, but I think it's really important for the Vygotskyan approach um, so that they can, as you say, learn all together using uh, contributing their own existing knowledge and, and working together. Um, Wendy asked, uh, have I looked at MR like a HoloLens app that allows students to work together on one project? Uh, this is where I hold up my HoloLens, right? So, and say, yeah, yeah, I, I, I have thought about HoloLens. I, I thought you'd have one there on the couch. <laughs> there you go. Um, only HoloLens 1, though, Wendy. The uni won't buy me HoloLens 2. But <laughs> uh, 5000 uh, The I picked VR because I don't see the value in an augmented reality environment unless... I, I'm quite passionate about saying augmented reality only really works where there's a contextual value in augmented reality. So the example that I often give is augmented reality makes sense when you want to put a couch in the corner of your room to see whether it fits, right? Because the room's involved in the interaction. Whereas I think if you're sort of putting planets and satellites over the top of a random room that you're standing in and it's not contextually relevant to the simulation, I'd probably prefer to use VR rather than AR. But that's my bias and, and uh, you, could, uh, you could argue for me, <laughs> argue that AR works better, but yeah, the, uh, that's I, I agree. I agree with you, Michael, on the basis of, of, of that choosing VR, but the reason why I mentioned that is because I've tested the HoloLens, the planet thing, and the multi-user thing mm. uh, so that that does exist but mm. I, I agree with you that it's out of context it's it does your head in a bit it's, yeah it's a bit weird so there's there's some existing planet tools on on hololens because it's better for multi-user i agree i've i've seen much better multi-user implementations with hololens than I totally forgive you if you go and make a cup of coffee. We've already discussed that. <laughs> <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I'm going to go back to doing my Moodle. <laughs> oh, 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 you're doing well. I, I was doing unit profiles yesterday. Going, I better get these in before the DDLT chases me. Well, it's, yes, all, all combined. I'm actually looking at the assessment tasks at the moment going, mm, do I need to tweak them? So, yes. <laughs> There's always something to do, something to keep this busy. <laughs> but no, I'll, I'll get off the air in case other people um, want to talk to you separately. And um, I can see Darren still hanging around too. Um, but thanks, guys. That was great. Thanks, Susan.
Um, hi, Michael. I'm um, sorry, I'm not putting my camera on because I don't have a great deal of bandwidth where I am. Um, but with regard to this project that you have uh, of research, because um, I'm an old high school teacher, I'm just wondering whether it would be um, whether you're considering having almost like an orientation phase um, in the virtual model um, whereby you, fat, you I can imagine it would be great for kids to have this, this sort of learning tool, but I just um, worry that um, yeah. it, there's an assumption that they'll know how to do things once they're in that virtual space um, as opposed to in the classroom. So I'm just wondering whether there should be a sandbox to begin with mm. that um, orientates them to the program, but also that's what I was talking about, finding out what they know already yes. um, before you got onto the instruction part. I think it's a really good idea. When we've done other virtual reality and mixed reality interventions, we found that scaffolding stuff, even with just a a video beforehand mm. they watch or something is often mm. really useful because you're right we make this implicit assumption that they're going to yeah. know how it all works and yeah. they don't and they end up they're sort of flailing around a lot at the beginning there um so yeah i i think that's a that's a good idea i think if it may be a, a video a little bit of it, it's but even just there what what they know um yeah. as you know and what how that relates to yeah. Yeah. um the the world they live in and then yeah. are there you know then you can jump into the virtual world yeah. um but i and just you know yeah just that um orientation that that's a really the good Gotsky is very into in that you have to establish yeah. what you know first before you yeah. can build anything i think that's a really good idea I, I think I think we should do that. I think, uh, and I, as I said, as soon as you said it, I thought to myself, I thought back to some of the stuff we've done in the past, and thought, yeah, we needed the orientation. That that was something we really really needed. Uh, so yeah, I um yeah okay yeah I'll, I'll take that on board. I think that's I think that's really useful. The um, what was I going to say? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I can't think. I've lost it now. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Thank you. But it sounds great. So good yeah. luck with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. Do we? Oh, that's what I was going to say. Do, are you? Are you CQU based or? Are you CQU -based? I am. I'm on Brisbane okay. campus, ALC. Okay. Okay. There's a presentation in a couple of weeks. I know I'm cross promoting, but um, from Jo Orlando for the Technology Enhanced Learning Cop. She's talking a bit about digital literacy and about that idea that you just mentioned that we shouldn't assume that all students. Are digitally literate. She talks about that quite a lot. So you might find Joe's uh, Joe's presentation interesting. Just to yeah, see. yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Mental literacy and meta. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I'm hearing it more and more now in the community. Mm -hmm. This idea that we all assume that these students know everything about tech. Because and I think the COVID tech. thing has really highlighted that enormously. Demonstrated that's not true. That's right. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm. Anyway, all right, I'm going to go and take a, a break and we'll, I'll see, might see you at 12 o'clock. Thanks, Natalie.